Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's session. My name's Fraser Deer, and I'm the Head of Data and Productivity Solutions at Cloud2, a BCN Group company. Today's session is about power apps in the NHS, and I'm thrilled to be able to introduce you to two panelists today to talk specifically on that topic. Today's session is going to be a bit of an odd one because we're going to talk about what is Power Platform, what are Power Apps, and actually show you real examples of two pieces of work that we've done with the Northern Care Alliance. Don't worry though, we've redacted all the data, so the applications that you'll see today don't include any patient identifiable data. The other thing to bear in mind is that today's session is a live event, so if you've got questions, please put it down in the, in the platform that you're on, because we'll be able to answer those questions during today's session. So without further ado, let me introduce the panel to you today. We've got John Lawton from Northern Care Alliance and Andy James from Cloud2. Hi. Hi, Fraser. How are we doing? Good, thank you. Do you want to give the audience a quick introduction? Yeah, sure. My name's John Lawton. I'm Head of Information Business Development at the Northern Care Alliance NHS Trust, which is in uh, Salford in Manchester, but we have sites all over Berry, Rochdale, Oldham. Uh, it's got about 20,000 employees. I've been there since 2008, but this is actually my 35th year in the NHS. Um, I'm head up a team of um, SharePoint Power Apps developers that um, are just kind of on that journey with Power Platform. So we've been doing some really exciting stuff with Cloud2 that has actually made a difference. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Andy? Um, so, my name is Andy James. I've been developing um, in Power Platform for um, a short while, relatively, mm -hmm. to some of my other team. Um, before that, I had a very different career, um, but I'm enjoying this new, new journey in the Power Platform. Um, so, my area of expertise is around Power Apps and Power Automate, and um, looking at all the technical ways that they tie together with the wider Power Platform. Um, I'm really lucky to be part of a great team at Cloud2 with specialists in SharePoint and data analytics and Power BI and a whole raft of other things that we're going to touch on today. Fantastic. Well, the first thing that we should do, I think, is probably introduce the Power Platform. So, Andy, can you just give us a quick overview of what's the Power Platform, how do Power Apps fit into the Power Platform, and then we'll take it on from there. Wonderful. I'd love to. So we've got a couple of slides that we're going to go through just to kind of give a taste as to what the Power Platform is all about. He says. So if we go on to the next slide, um, we'll see that the Power Apps, uh, Power BI, Power Automate, they're the main kind of topics that people talk about when we think of Power Platform. But they are um, a small part of the, the suite of apps that make up the platform in totality. Um, we have Power Virtual Agents, so uh, chatbots, we have Power Pages that make websites, and they can sit on all kinds of different connectors to uh, interlink that information and pass information around um, to allow for the automation and uh, data visualizations. There's uh, artificial intelligence that is fundamental uh, and baked into the Power Platform we can tap into. And we have a number of different options for databases that we can use. Uh, Dataverse, um, is um, the more structured database that we use, but we're also quite adept in using SharePoint lists and SQL databases and other, uh, some of the other options that, that are open to us. But as we said today, we're going to look primarily at Power Apps. So the benefit of the Power App is that it gives a really simple, fantastically configurable user interface um, to, to your staff, to your users. Um, that interface can include a number of validations. It can trigger automations. It can tie into rules that are set in a Dataverse um, table to make sure that the right information is recorded in the right way at the right time. And that in doing so, it's able to, act, able to interact with all the different data that we, that we may be recording. Because we have a better way and an easier way of inputting the information, we can make it smarter, um, which makes it quicker and easier for users. So while we're increasing kind of efficiency and cost and uh, reducing the amount of time it takes, uh, we're then reducing the cost that the overall process can take. But we're also reducing that time cost that uh, staff face, mm. which then allows them to focus on the... the the more important work, the stuff that they have to do that they're kind of trained and specialized in. So if we take a really basic case study, you may have a call center, uh, someone where um, uh, so for taking support tickets, the, a client may ring up with a, a problem or an issue or a question. 
That may then get passed to someone um, to actually interact with that information. If we go on to the next uh, slide. Um, and then all of that information, what we've recorded, what we're reporting on, how far we're going through, will end up coming to another person um, for some kind of analytics and tracking. And in the center of this process, we have uh, the client, the, the customer, the person that we're, kind of, we're all focusing on. This will be very, um, you know, a, a common situation in most businesses. And where the Power Platform ties in is that when we're taking calls, we're recording that information, we can have automations that trigger notifications, and that can be a whole raft of things. They can create documents and templates, they can um, do a, a host of different uh, tasks automatically to save you from having to do it. The person who's actually doing the work and interacting might be using a Power App to be able to process that task, provide the updates, um, log their, their time and uh, any, uh, any work that they're doing, provide validation in the same way we've already spoken about. All of that information can be surfaced really easily um, and clearly in some beautiful visualizations within a Power BI report for tracking. And in the center, the client may not even have to speak to us. We could use virtual agents um, or other Power App um, type interfaces, Power Pages, for example, to be able to have that back and forth communication with the client. All of that is integrated. Um, it all talks to uh, each other. Uh, it's all interoperable. Um, and that's the, the power that comes with the Power Platform. So one of the big questions we often have, and one of the things we start with is, that's fantastic, but do I have this? Um, it's a little bit of a magic eight ball. Um, it depends on a number of things, usually around licenses. But the good thing is that it usually, um, there are all sorts of different options. We have the more basic licenses that give us access to create apps and um, higher level processes and automations. But there are some things, um, for example, as we've seen here, if we're using uh, particular APIs or we're looking to tie into Dataverse or SQL, then we do have to look at some more premium connectors and premium licenses. Anything that's kind of scaled back from that, then chances are it will be baked in and part of your current license, part of your environment, um, and it's probably there that um, quite often people don't realize that they've already got access and um, we can start using these things straight away. Um, so yeah, that's quite a, a small nutshell and I'm massively underselling it, but that is <laughs> essentially the, uh, the Power Platform. Thanks, Andy. I mean, I think one of the things that you can quite clearly see from this is that we're actually talking about a platform here. This is not just Power Apps in, in kind of isolation. You need some other parts of the platform to make the solution work. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, very much so. It's like, um, it's often described as a digital Lego set. So we can take a Power App with an automations sat on top of SharePoint or Dataverse. Yeah. All of that information can be visualized and shown in uh, Power BI. So it's, it's that collection and how we get those elements to work together that, that gives us the, the breadth to do what we do. Brilliant. Well, look, we've talked a bit about how it all kind of fits together. Let's just dive straight in. Let's look at an application that we've built for Northern Care Alliance and actually let's see this in practice. So let's have a little look at the Paragang Paraganglioma app. So the first application we're gonna have a look at um, is created to track and manage and follow paraganglioma tumors in patients across the country. Uh, in this demonstration, within this application, we're gonna see uh, simple data entry, validation and some logic. And this application is a really good example of where the application itself does the heavy lifting. The application looks after the validation, makes sure that the information is recorded appropriately and correctly um, to ensure that the user has as straightforward and simple and user facing and, and an experience as possible. So this application allows the NHS to track paraganglioma tumors across the patients that they're treating. The benefit of this is that they can manage all of the information captured across all of those patients, across all of the trusts in the country, in a single place, allowing them to look for trends and identify best practice, um, where previously this wasn't available because the information that they stored was kept individually by each trust. The information wasn't shared, it wasn't as readily available. So this is the problem that they're trying to solve, and this is the application that we've made to try and help them to solve it. So if we look at the application, the first screen that you'll start with is the patient list, which funnily enough lists all of the patients. 
We can filter this list by unit or hospital number, or we can change it and look at surname and change by date of birth if needed. If we have a look at one of our patients, let's say Tinkerbell, we get to a patient screen that loads all of the information about that patient. We can see all the details and we can change what we need. Looking at things like signs and symptoms, we can see um, the history, all of these different signs and symptoms and hearing issues that this person has had and how they've changed over time. We can also see all of the individual tumours this person has. Clicking on one, we can look at the scans that have taken place during the course of this tumour and all the treatments that have been prescribed to the person. We can see trends within the app as to how the tumour has changed size over time and we can look at all of the individual treatments, all of the different complications that each of those have um, pr produced as the person's gone through that particular treatment. All of this information can be edited and updated. It's consistent. We can have logic so that if they change the different treatments, we have different fields to record the information that's relevant to that treatment. This is exactly the same with the scans. Different scans have different requirements in the information that needs to be recorded so that it can be properly analysed and the benefits that we're trying to realise from this application can be found. We can also change all of the details that we need to in regards to the person in the same way by editing the details and being able to share that information across the country. With all of that information in place, we're able to look at some very basic analytics and we can see trends, we can see changes, we can see um, that on a person level, on a location, we can do it by demographic of uh, the individual patient um, and any groups that they may uh, come under. And all of that information can be held centrally, it can be analysed centrally, and the best practice and the best care for the individuals across the country can come from that group of experts. So that was the Paraganglioma app, uh, where the application does the heavy lifting and the user has a simpler experience. So now, back to the panel. Wow, that's really amazing. Great to see that application actually live in the system. John, can you just articulate a little bit about kind of where the idea for this application came from? Yeah, sure. So obviously paraganglionoma is a rare type of tumour. Affects about two in a million people. So there's not that much data on these patients, certainly in the UK. And one of our clinicians at the Trust, um, with the three other centres in the UK that, that deal with these patients, they wanted a way that they could track um, the patients through and just kind of track changes so they can so they can progress and get more data so the idea behind it was that as they're treating their patients they are they are collecting um, data that will allow better treatments they'll be able to use it in research obviously it'll just be aggregated data that comes out of the system and the the, the patients aren't shared between sites but collectively, that data will help um, improve treatments for long-term paraganglionoma patients. And what do you think the actual impact is for the clinician side? I mean, obviously, you talk about the data there, but what would be the what would be the consequence of not doing this app, for example? Again, it's so collectively. If they if they're not if they're not talking to each other and they've got nothing to share, then actually, there's the, the, they're not they're not being able to collectively. Um, Look at different treatment options. Look at look at what's happening with different patients. Is is there are there trends in the patients that they're not seeing in in one of the other centres? Patients. There's all sorts of ramifications in terms of how they can how they can use that and plan and discuss and open up dialogue between them about their patients collectively. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Andy, obviously putting an application together like this isn't straightforward. Can you talk to us a little bit about kind of the like process and kind of some of the challenges you face? Absolutely. Um, the first one was pronunciation of the application <laughs> itself. Um, so lots of time practicing that. Um, but the, luckily, the, the team we were working with, the clinicians and, and John, um, were able to provide all of that information. So they, uh, they took me through the process end to end, what it was we were trying to achieve. Um, so I could kind of uh, build an arch architecture to make sure we had the right tables, the right information, 
But while we were doing that, also be mindful of the security. As John says, this is patient sensitive information. So making sure that although there are sharing agreements in place between the trust, that we're not overstepping the mark, um, we're, not, uh, we're, we're, we're managing that data appropriately um, and not taking advantage of, of anything. That was one of the main, um, the, the main challenges we had, and for very good reason. So when John was able to get those sharing agreements in place, then we could tie everything together to make sure that the, the foundation we'd, we'd made um, mm. w w was enough and, and was, uh, was appropriate. So once we knew what we were going to be doing with the data, and we had some restrictions um, due to licenses and things, which um, we overcame, um, the process itself is relatively straightforward. So then it was an iterative back and forth with the clinicians to make sure um, that we were capturing the information that they needed to capture in a way that was really easy. Um, mm. Instead of having to reuse information and re-input the same information over and over again, actually we can draw it out of other places. We could be a bit smarter with how we, we did it. Um, as John says, we're looking at trends. Mm. So we, instead of people having to identify those, we can have automation. So if a new type of treatment is used, then that can automatically notify people instead of relying on the clinician to, to tell people or other people to kind of hunt it out. So there were technicalities with the infrastructure, um, the data uh, security and sensitivity. The process itself was okay um, and quite straightforward. And then it was just looking at how we could make it a better user experience and a bit smarter for, for the, the longer term and just to realize the benefits that we were trying to achieve. Fantastic. Well, look, um, obviously this is a live session, so if you do have questions, please drop them down onto the platform that you're watching on. Uh, we have had a question in, actually, and um, one of the questions is around the kind of platform itself. So clearly the Paraganglioma app has been laid out in a kind of desktop format, but can Power Apps be used on mobiles as well? How does that work? Absolutely. Um, we have a number of options. When, a, when an application is created, the first thing that we need to decide is, is it going to be a uh, a mobile phone app, or is it going to be for a tablet or a desktop? Um, the applications themselves can be um, reactive to the uh, to the device that they're using. So we don't have to hard code, it's this wide and this tall. We can say, fill the screen, only use this part of the screen. Um, with using uh, a mobile phone app, there come other uh, functionality that we can use. Um, being a phone, there's um, GPS locations mm. and uh, cameras for barcode scanners and uh, near-field communication, wireless tap-and-go and bits. So with a mobile phone app, we can look at all of those different types of options. But absolutely, the applications themselves can be responsive to the device that they're on. So we can, we can make for both. Fantastic. Okay, well, Luke, let's take the next step. How does it work doing a project with Cloud2 BCN? And what would the process be? So let's have a little look at that. So what's it like doing a project with Cloud2? First of all, we start with one of two things, either an idea or a problem. Many of our clients come to us and they don't know exactly what they're looking for. That can, that can come from one of two places, a process or a gap in the existing processes within your organizations. So what do we do? Well, the first thing we do is a bit of discovery. What is it you're trying to achieve? And how are you looking to get that done? And in our organization, we call that an initiation. An initiation is where we engage with your organization to understand your business processes in an awful lot more detail than we are looking to achieve X or Y. We get into the details. We understand your people and what it is that you're really looking to achieve. The next step in the process is looking at the design. How do we achieve what you're looking for? And in some cases, how quick can we do it? This is what we call the design and planning phase. The important thing to remember here is we're trying to ascertain what's going to work for your employees. Is it a mobile phone app? that enables people to log in on the fly to do an activity? Or is it something that's more desktop based? A larger application perhaps, where you need multiple things or multiple things on the screen at the same time. Step three is the fun bit, particularly for myself. This is where we bring our developers and your business together. This is step three, and this is the development stage. 
Here, we'll be taking what we've ascertained from the initiation and the design, and we'll be building on that from your business requirements into user stories. The user stories are the things that the developers use to actually code the solution. Now, within the Power Platform, as we know, it's low code, but actually, in order to achieve your business objectives, this is where we add our magic. This is where we create something that's bespoke for you in your organization. The next step is where we do two steps. Now for the maths in you, this one works, whereas this one does not. And this is the first step in our testing process. This is an internal process where we validate that the developer has understood your user stories to ensure that the project is deliverables are against what exactly you're looking for. So this is for a testing. The next step is one of the one of the moments that I really really enjoy. It's where we get to share with you the client the resultant solution. And it's another developer special. And this is called step 4B user acceptance testing. So once we've established that you're happy as a client with the solution and hopefully a little bit more than happy we take that next step, which is where we do the go live. This is where we take your business users and apply a controlled environment whereby we can launch this process, this product, this feature, this gap, or this idea with your business users. In some cases, organizations will want to do this on their own. They'll want to project manage it. They'll have teams of people in place to ensure that any questions or, or training needs actually are established within the team. However, it's something that we can also support you with. So if you've got a large establishment and you need to go live on a particular time or date, we can be there with you doing hypercare to make sure that it's a great success. Now, the last step depends on what it is we're doing with you. So sometimes we may go to close. Fantastic. We, we got what you were looking for, we understood it, we developed it, we tested it, we went live, and actually, it's working. Fantastic. But in some cases, we may actually be doing something else. I'm going to put down CI, but what I mean by that is this could be an iterative loop. We have an idea, we actually might break it down into chunks. We do the process, being mindful of your overall objective, but actually we release it in phases. So this cycle could continue and continue until we've got to that overarching objective. So that's how you do a project with Cloud2. Welcome back to the studio. John, um, you know, we've obviously just gone through the process of developing an app. Um, and as Andy's outlined earlier on, you know, this is a kind of low code platform. So what's it like actually working with Cloud2 on these kind of projects? So I think, I think what you've just seen kind of really works. So we, that, works for, that works for us and it, it, it helped that we were involved at every stage. I think what's really important is that when we get to that delivery stage, that when we get the product, the app um, handed back to us, us as an internal development team, then we, we kind of reverse engineer that. We look at that and we unpick it. So my internal development team had then absolutely know and understand how it works, and then we further develop that. So we're not reliant then on Cloud2 for any further enhancements, unless we're really pushed and we're really stressed and we've got lots of resource issues. But actually, it's about learning, it's about engaging my team to be able to understand and learn from some of the tricks and, and development processes that you use in the actual app itself. And I think that's really important that once you've handed it back, it's on sat and we've signed it off. It's like that we're self-reliant yeah. on developing it further. And so what, what do you get from Cloud2 that enables you to do that? I think it's just the, 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 the insight into how, I think it's ideas. I think sometimes you were quite tunneled in, we can't do this, we're not sure how to do it. And actually, it, it, it's the expertise from you guys that you know, you know, sometimes, actually, we didn't even know such a function existed kind of thing and it's just about best practice and doing things doing things how in a more structured way 
Fantastic. Um, just checking, there's no further uh, questions on the process. So let's dive into the next app. Um, John, you came to us uh, probably about six months or so ago, um, and we talked about something called a discharge planning app. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think we talked about it for a couple of weeks, and then we embarked on a journey. So can you just give yeah. us a bit of an outline of what was the problem? What was the use yeah. case? So, it, in, so since COVID, when COVID was um, first came around nearly three years ago now, the um, NHS, the centre, were really, um, there, was, there was this thirst for data collections and th the rapid change that um, NHS providers and commissions needed to respond to that um, was just, it, it, it was colossal. There was just so much that they wanted and actually systems weren't in place for us to collect that information that suddenly became a national requirement. And one of those was a, a daily discharge submission that they wanted across um, the country. So we had to cobble something together and we weren't the only ones if I talked to any of my colleagues that the, the good old Excel spreadsheet came out. <laughs> um, and what we tried to do is we tried to help the, the, the coordinators and the teams and the clinical teams in terms of collecting this data. We, we kind of pre-filled it with current patients that were in the hospital for each of our sites. The issue with that is that it's completely out of date as soon as they've got it. So actually what was happening is they were filling in this, this quite intricate spreadsheet and actually patients that were on that list had actually been sent home or they'd been transferred to another ward or they'd been sent to another one of our other sites. So it was out of date. Then there was the whole cumbersome way that, that we got that data back and kind of imported it into our local data warehousing platforms in order to be able to make a submission. And that went, that's went that been going on for two years. So there had to be another way, there just had to be another way. So I thought actually Power Apps could help here. And with some, um, I, I put together a kind of proof of concept app in my very limited way, um, which went down really well. So we thought if we want this doing, and we need to learn from it. So we thought, well actually Cloud2 could help us because we know that we can do this quite rapidly. And I think from a development point of view, it wasn't just us saying what that needed. That's where the engagement came with the teams themselves about what they wanted to include. And that was working with our partners at the, the, local, health, the local health councils on our seat and our, our commissioners as well. So it was, a collective, it was a collective development and a drive to get not just what we needed from a daily reporting, but what would also be useful for the organisation in helping get patients home safely. Amazing. So we've, we've kind of gone from, with the paraganglioma app, probably a lower usage because it's, you know, it's a, a low level, but it's actually very specialist. Whereas this is much more daily. This is much yes. more live data. This yes. is live running. This is yes. now here and actually with a direct impact to, to the trust. Yes. yes. So, so it sounds like we're upping the complexity factor a wee bit here, just a smidge. Andy, what challenges did you face in building this one? Um, we up the complexity factor. <laughs> um, there were the so similarly with paraganglioma, we need to be mindful of um, securities and sensitivity of data. Um, so there's a running theme with all, all of the applications and process we've got there. Um, with the paraganglioma app, it was it's a nice simple process. We speak to a patient, we record their details, we have a catch up, we record the details. Jobs are good. Um, it was. Uh, a bit of a slower pace process. Um, the information needs to be live, it needs to be ready, readily available, but the turnover isn't, um, isn't excessive. With uh, this particular application, as you said, John, the, the turnover of patients is huge. Mm. The staff rotations, the, the number of people who are gonna be accessing it, yeah. the number of people who are gonna be using the application at any one time, yeah. the number of calls to the database to send all the updates. Yeah. Um, the, so even if we just boil it back to, we have a patient and I need to record if they're gonna be discharged or not, data input, on the surface, nice and straightforward. But it's that wider breadth of, well, actually now we're looking at the number of patients, this application needs to be scalable. So if we create it for one ward on one hospital, actually if this gets rolled out wider, yeah. as it has done now across four different hospitals, all the different wards on those hospitals, all of those staff, the turnover. Um, so there's a bigger demand on the application. It needs to be robust, um, needs to be reliable. One of the other, um, the other benefits to 
exactly what you said, John, was also one of the challenges in that we were working with so many people to get the requirements to make sure it did what everybody needed. It needed to do a lot of things. Mm. Um, if a patient was being discharged to certain um, uh, locations, then actually there was more information we needed, especially around COVID securities and vulnerabilities, that, mm. um, issues that may or then arise. Um, so we had logic built in for there. We have around repatriations. So at all different stages, we're talking to other people and um, working as consultants, not just as developers, we could have those conversations yeah. to work out, you know, are, are we ticking all the boxes? What, what can we do? Where can we take some heavy lifting out with some automation yeah. to make a better user experience? Um, and then all of that kind of bundled together in a simple to use clear application with really nice straightforward user interface so that we were getting that consistent information. We were getting the, the quick reporting. The staff looking at it um, would see live, these are the patients, these are who's outstanding, this is how long they've been here, how long we've meant to be, um, when they should have gone home, how, all of those kind of metrics really clear to the user. So it's identifying the, the key um, points the key functionality, uh, focusing in, in on those, but making sure that we're kind of ticking every box that we can yeah. for, for all the users. Um, and then pack packaging it up, as I say, in a robust application, because the usage of it was so, uh, so high. It's really high demand. Well, you've certainly wet my appetite, so let's go and have a look at it. So the second application we're going to have a look at is um, to allow healthcare professionals to rationalise and record whether a patient is ready to be discharged from the hospital and go home or whether there's a requirement for them to stay on the ward for further treatment, tests or whatever reason there may be. This application is more involved. There's a greater detail, a, a more complicated uh, process behind it. But again, the application tries to do the heavy lifting and make it as simple for the user as possible. So that's the application we're going to have a look at now. Unlike the first application that was quite simple in its structure, in that it was just data input, taking data out, uh, and a little bit of analytical work from a centralized database, this application is more complex in its structure and more specialized in its need. Um, across every hospital, all of the patients that are currently sat in wards and um, essentially taking spaces need to be reviewed regularly to see if they're ready to be discharged and sent either home or to a hospice or wherever it is that they're going to be leaving the hospital and going to. That's the purpose of this application. It shows all of the patients that are currently um, within the hospital and it allows you um, the opportunity to see all of the information that relates to them so that you can perform that review, record your rationale and any other information that's relevant in the decision making process as to whether that person should stay with you for a little bit longer or whether it's time for them to be discharged. If it is time for them to be discharged then um, the application will record where that person's going to be discharged to, roughly the time that they're going there and the different pathways, the different support that they may need when they get to that location. So let's have a look. If we start with the ward reviews, this gives us a list of all of the different hospitals and within each hospital it gives us a list of all of the different wards. So you can look specifically at the ward that you're interested in or the ward that you're working on. From here, we can see the basic overview details of each of the patients who are currently on the, uh, on the ward. We can see the current pathway um, if there is one recorded. So for example, Shere Khan, if we hover over, we can see that he has uh, a requirement for some active support once discharged to um, his home address. If we click on a uh, patient, we're taken to the screen where we can view all of their patient details. We can also see the hospital details, the place that they're currently staying. And we get to answer the questions and record the information needed um, for this review. So the first question is, does the patient meet the criteria to reside? So currently we're saying no, Tinkerbell does not meet the criteria to reside at the hospital. She's ready to go back, um, back home. If we change it to yes, then the question's changed. Um, if she's staying, then we need to know why. If she's not staying, then we need to know where she's going and what time. So that validation and the ability to be dynamic in how we're recording information is fundamental to this application. 
If we're looking at, um, in this instance, that Tinkerbell does not have the criteria to reside and she's going to be leaving, then we can say when, roughly, um, we can add in if there's uh, any issues with uh, COVID, which is still an issue in a number of places. And we need to record whereabouts uh, Tinkerbell is going to be um, discharged to. If we record that it's going to be her home, her domestic home address, then we have the pathways relevant to that area. If we were to say that she's going to a care home, then we'll have options to record the pathway and the support required for that area. So again, the validation's there to make sure that we're recording the right information against the right person for the right reasons in the right circumstances. What you may also have noticed is once these fields were completed, the submit button became active. Up until that point, it was deactivated, ensuring that it's not possible to only record half of a story. There are some fields which can be left blank. They're not necessary. They're always helpful, but they're not required. But we can ensure through validation and the logic within the application that you're not able to submit half completed records. In this instance, if we're going to discharge Tinkerbell to this care home, further validation is uh, embedded in the application. Because of the vulnerability that comes with being at a care home, we have some questions just to ask about um, COVID statuses. With that submitted, we can go back to the uh, ward list. We'll be able to see Tinkerbell here. We'll see that her status has changed to show that she's now ready to go home, um, instantly identifiable by the uh, simple color coding. And again, if we hover over, we can see the, the pathway that we've chosen for her. If we click on the little book icon to the side, we can look at each of the different uh, reviews that have taken place at the different times and dates and by the different people. So there's that whole history of decision making that comes with it. With all of uh, this information being recorded centrally, we can also report on it centrally. We can look at live patient analytics. This was a massive benefit to, um, to the Northern Care Alliance. Um, a number of pieces of information that they needed for these key metrics, this uh, to allow for decision making and proper monitoring and management. Um, were recorded in multiple spreadsheets, they were shared via email, some of it was only written on whiteboards within the ward, making it incredibly difficult to find the information that was necessary and be able to make the decisions and manage the hospitals appropriately, as well as to therefore care appropriately for the patients and ensure that they were discharged uh, within an appropriate time frame and to appropriate locations. All of this is built into the application. It's fundamental to how the application works and helps solve the problem that the Northern Care Alliance NHS Foundation Trust came to us with. So that application hopefully shows the power of the power platform, how we can input data and manipulate data within the application in a straightforward user interface. And it gives the immediate um, overview of how uh, the land lies, where the patients are and all the metrics needed so the decision makers can do just that to ensure the safe running of a hospital for the patients. So now we're gonna go back to the panel. Fantastic, it's great to see an application that brings together both the user interface but also the analytics. So John, how was that received by the team? So surprisingly well actually. I think for so long that they've been coping with a really cumbersome, clunky system, that, and because they'd been involved um, in the development of it, that it, 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 it was received really well. And I think more people, the, the amount of requests and getting, oh, can, I, can I access that? I believe that we have an app now that we use. So actually every day we're, we're rolling it out to more and more users on the wards as well, because the wards are re actually responsible for doing this as well themselves. Um, in terms of how it's been received um, across the organisation, I think now we've got some data coming out of it. Um, it's also benefited our corporate information team who are the ones that are responsible for doing the submission. The amount of time it's took for them to just get this data handed to them um, where they can extract it quickly and easily without the whole process that they used to go through. So it's actually it's made their lives and reduced the amount of time it takes to actually make a submission. Amazing. And, and so as far as impacts for Northern Care Alliance, 
you know, if you were to talk about kind of what was the impact just on this one application, what, what, what do you think you would say? I think it's the ability to actually see at any point in time where we're up to, that real-time look of who's waiting for what, why, why a patient can't go home. And because that's real-time, we can, you can do something with it. You can actually act upon it. And the whole point of this is allowing our patients to get home quicker and safer. And with that data, we, we, we can instantly see who's waiting for what. And actually, again, again, we're so pressured at the moment with beds that getting the patients out safely to home or wherever they need to go is like the utmost priority for us. Amazing. And, and so, so you think the application has actually enabled benefits to not only the patient, but also your team? Yes, definitely. And I think because we've got, because we're keeping all the data historically as well, the, the aim is that actually we can start, I mean, it's early days, but because we're keeping that data historically, we can now start to look at trends over time to say, actually, as an organisation or per, per site, where are our pinch points? What are we doing? Are we, are we getting better? Are we getting worse at sending patients home? And, and actually, what are the reasons why? So actually, the more data you have historically, the more you can put those AI elements on top of that mm. to build models to say, actually, that's where some of your predictions will start coming in when there's enough data gathered. Amazing. And so, Andy, I mean, you've, you've set the stage there brilliantly. You know, we've got an application now. We've come to the end of that initial development cycle. What could come next? Oh, this is where I get overexcited <laughs> and have to be reined back in. Um, there, are no, there are a number of different options. Um, if we're looking at the infrastructure, the back end, the foundations of this, um, this application is currently built in SharePoint. Um, that was part of the requirements um, for a number of reasons. And SharePoint works. This application is live, it is working, it, it absolutely does the job. Um, but it is not um, fundamentally a database. So we've had to put some other elements in place to make uh, to to give us the functionality that we need. So uh, moving that to Dataverse or somewhere where that uh, those functions that we've had to build are already there mm -hmm. and caked in with um, it's more performant and with more securities in place fun, um, just from the off uh, would always be better. Mm. But SharePoint works. So um, fundamentally, there are th changes we can make in the back end. To, uh, to the application. As far as the, the user interface and the application itself goes, um, the sky's the limit. Um, we, if we're doing a review of a person um, in a bed, we know where the bed is, we know who the person is, we don't need to find them, we could use uh, barcode scanning, mm. we could use RFID, we could have um, all kinds of different ways to interact to, again, make the application smarter. So you can walk up with a phone, tap it on the bed, it knows who's in the beds, there's their records, and we can, we can go through. Um, some colleagues of ours have already made uh, augmented reality data visualizations so that while you're going around with a, a phone or a tablet, you can hold it to the bed and you can see the, um, in augmented reality, virtual reality, the metrics and the, the information around this, uh, this patient. And as that patient moves around wards and other hospitals, that information goes with them. Um, the, the sky's kind of the limit, as John's already alluded to, the more information we have in, the data sets and the modeling is, is there ready to start looking at trends and AI to try and identify where the issues are automatically, to be able to look at demographics of patients, to identify risks so that we can get ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. So the, the, yeah, the sky's the absolute limit and I have to hold myself back a little bit. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Well, look, um, we've actually had some questions in from the audience. So I'm gonna try and capture three questions in one if that's all right. We'll break it into two parts. So we've got a question from Sherry that says, does any of your apps integrate with EMR? And we've also got a question from Matthew to say, what if any data is fed back into the main PaaS system? So we'll start there. John? Okay. So at Northern Care Alliance, we don't connect anything to our, and I'm, and I'm assuming EMR, we mean electronic patient record system. We, we, don't, we don't connect anything direct to our EPR. However, you could, if your, if your data warehouse has e, e, EMR, EPR data in it, you can connect it to that. None of the apps that we've developed so far do that, um, but potentially you could if you've got the right connectors to that back end. Okay, and Sawar asks, um, where the, what were the core applications used, or sorry, what were the core apps used to build Home First app, and were there any on-prem gateways used? And then maybe, Andy, you could also comment on connectors, as, as John's just alluded to. Yeah, so... 
Um, the application for the, for the discharge, the home first, there is a, uh, a SharePoint backend that is accessed through um, the user's uh, Microsoft account. So that's, and again, this part of the beauty of the Power Platform is that is all baked in, those securities, that access uh, is all managed by the, um, by the admin that, um, that comes with yeah. the 365 licenses yeah. and, and admin centers. Um, so we're a SharePoint backend, we're a Canvas app front end, so those connectors are standard connectors. That's nothing special. If you have Power Apps, then you could absolutely do everything we're talking about straight away. I think for, for me as well, certainly with the Discharge app, we, we recognize that there's no, we, we don't have any premium licensing in the organization, but there was a challenge to get that live data from our, our, our PaaS system, the current inpatient. So although it's not a live, it's not a premium connector, that it, we've, we've found a workaround to that. So actually we get a extract from our, into, into a, a, from our past system into one of our data warehouses every 10 minutes of a live inpatient court. And then we've used some ingenious workarounds that I'm quite happy to share with people how we've done that um, to get that into SharePoint every 10 minutes. And that's been running for probably about 12 months now without any issues. So that's, and again, it just then uses the standard connectors for the app itself. Absolutely. And, and so, so Andy, if we wanted to do connection to a third party data source, that there wasn't a standard connector within the Power Platform, and there are hundreds, how would we go about doing that? Very easily. Um, it's quite common practice to create your own connectors. So as you say, there's over 700 connectors to all kinds of different systems. So MailChimp and all kinds of non-Microsoft third party uh, services and providers and all kinds of bits and pieces. But absolutely, there are going to be occasions we want to tie into a system or a product um, or a service that doesn't have something that's readily available. Um, you can create custom connectors. As long as that service has uh, an API we can tie into, whether it's an open one or we need to register for and have credentials and um, use access tokens and keys, that's absolutely fine. But as long as there's a way to tie into it, we can create a custom connector to do all of that, um, that data integration. Fantastic. Um, well, look, um, we still have a couple of minutes left for a few more questions, so I'm going to dive in with um, John. What's the next hero application for Northern Care Alliance? Okay, so we're, so there's there's so many ideas that <laughs> we, there's so many kind of business problems that you'd want to solve overnight. I think the one that that's recently cropped up that we think can make a big difference is um, so within. Um, the, the, the GM area, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a program called the Lung Health Check where patients over the age of um, 50 who are smokers um, are invited by their GPs to take part in a Lung Health Check program. Um, and that's operated um, by Northern Care Alliance. And it, we, we track patients, so if somebody wants to uptake them, we will offer them um, a telephone appointment, we'll offer them a CT scan, we'll offer them, and, and it's a way of tracking those patients through to make sure that, um, you know, that, that, that if, there's any, if there's anything um, that comes out of the result of that health check that they're seen quickly. Um, and so there's, we're working with that team in order to build something that will help. They have something at the moment, again, it's really, it's really clunky and cumbersome, and actually this is a perfect way of being able to put that in, putting some automation in there, putting something that's really robust for them that, that helps the team get those patients quickly seen. Brilliant. Um, Andy, I've got one for you. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a name of the, the question E, but um, I've got no coding experience. Can I still create Power Apps? It's 100%. A great one. 100%. Um, Power Apps, Power Automate, um, the, the Power Platform is um, marketed or, or uh, sold as being low code, no code. Now, it, it's very important to make that distinction that low code doesn't mean no code. Um, when you have a button that you want it to trigger something, you have to code that button. Um, if you've used, so my, my Kickstarter into all of this was a love of um, Excel formulas. Mm. So if you can kind of understand the logic of an Excel formula, then there's nothing in Power Apps that you can't yeah. learn. You can't wrap your head around. It's the same logic, if statements, um, concatenations, uh, all of those kind of things. But with the standard connectors that we've already spoken about, a lot of that hard work, a lot of those building yeah. blocks uh, are already there. Mm. So you can absolutely say, I want to start a new Canvas app. Um, I want to put some buttons in. I want a gallery. I want it to tie into my SharePoint list. Show me all my stuff. Um, so it's really easy. Um, it's really easy to use as a beginner. Mm. 
on top of that, the number of YouTube videos and Microsoft <laughs> webinars yeah. and blogs and posts to um, to kind of that are aimed at those beginners yeah. who don't have the experience and they are keen to learn. Um, it, it's it's sometimes overwhelming, but there's some fantastic content out there that was yeah. really helpful. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, well, look, um, we're coming towards the end of our time. So just a quick recap. We've covered what's Power Apps, what's the Power Platform. We've looked at two Northern Care Alliance applications, both of, well, one of which is live and one of which is in UAT. Um, we've covered how to work with Cloud2 BCN Group. Um, and we've also answered a number of the questions that have come through from the audience today. Obviously, there are some more questions, but we, we are running out of time now. So if you do have any further questions, please do reach out to us at the uh, BCN Group, Cloud2, and we'll be able to come back to you with, with answers specifically. Um, so just to wrap up, um, obviously we've gone through quite a lot of content today and there's so, so much more to cover. Um, each one of those little coloured blobs in Andy's initial presentation is an hour in its own right. Um, if you've got questions, do f please feel free to reach out to us, even if it's I'd love to do something, but I don't even know what. Mm. Think about the way that we work. Think about that process. Think about that idea generation, and we'll take it from there and build something e epic for you and your organization. Um, a couple of quick adverts, of course. Um, today was focused specifically on Power Apps, Canvas Apps. Our next session is going to be looking at Power BI and actually the transformations that we've done with one of our other clients taking their business data and making it real and live for their business users and giving them insights into things that they didn't even know was going on within their organization. So that's coming soon. Um, and all that's really left for me to do today now is to thank my panel. Thank you very much, John. Well, thank you very much, Andy, um, for coming in today and, and having a chat with me here on the sofa and wishing you all a great afternoon and have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.